Oh, good. It's up. Uh, I, I am teaching through the book of Daniel. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and find Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. It's right after Ezekiel, right before Daniel chapter 2. And since I typed it out this time, I don't really know what page number it's on. I'll find it for you guys. Especially for you, Jose. Oh, there it is. I, I passed it. Daniel chapter 1, some 465. All right. So Daniel was a special guy. We know Daniel. We love him. Uh, he wrote 12 chapters in this book. The first six are historic. The second six are prophetic. And tonight we're going to be looking at chapter 1, uh, Daniel's special diet. I like that. Except I don't like his diet. We'll get there later on. Uh, I made a little timeline for you guys. If you guys were wondering where Daniel fits into to all of time, right there. That's where it is. Or if you're on TV, it's probably like maybe there. Um, and so, so I started this timeline at creation. Oh, which is off the screen. My PowerPoint's bigger than the screen. Uh, and, then, and, and that's about 4,000 BC. I'm just doing rough years uh, because it's easier to understand. And I marked every 500 years from the flood on, just so you can get an idea of where this fits in all time. Daniel's right there, uh, and he lives for, we don't know how long he lives for, I, I guess 100 years, because he was old by the end of it, um, right there at the exile when they start coming back, uh, all the way to when they came back. And then he, these are the kings he served under. Uh, tonight we're going to look at Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and, and he's going to serve under him for most, actually a lot of chapters. And then the next few he kind of skips over in his, in his writings. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. Hopefully you found it by now. Uh, Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 say, In the third year of, of the reign of Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, which some article with some articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, uh, to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into his treasure of his God. So that's verses 1 and 2. And if we look at it, it, it gives us the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim. He was the king of Judah, of course. It calls, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, comes. He, Nebuchadnezzar comes three times to Jerusalem. Uh, this is the first time. The first time he takes Daniel and his friends uh, and... Um, and, some, and the articles of the, of the Lord out of the temple, and these things he puts in the temple of his God, and these are the same articles uh, that, of God that his grandson Belshazzar comes and gets out and, and does bad things with and drinks and, and, and mocks God uh, when the handwriting comes on the wall and uh, writes, in, uh, writes in his plaster. And we're going to get there in chapter 5. If you can't wait, go ahead and read it. Later, not now. Uh, it's a fun chapter. The king poops in his pants, uh, and, and you, you got to love that. But you would, too, if you just saw this disembodied hand come out of nowhere and write in, in your wall uh, a judgment against you. Um, so that's what he does. Um, but notice also in the verse that, that it wasn't like Nebuchadnezzar just won the battle, right? Because in those days, they thought, if, if we win the battle, that means our God is stronger than your God because your God couldn't protect you. That's why we take your stuff, put it in the temple of our God. Um, but Nebuchadnezzar wasn't stronger than God. God gave his people over. And that is a very, very important distinction. When we lose, it's because God gives us over because of our sin. And I'm not saying like the election or anything. I'm talking about when we are spiritually defeated. It's because God gave us over, because we've sinned. And unfortunately, you hear of pastors in the news, or you might know one personally that have fallen from the pulpit, and they, they, they did a great job teaching the Word of God, but then some secret comes out, and they have to step down. And it is so sad, and it is so heartbreaking, not only for the pastor, I'm sure it is for the Lord as well, and it is for every single one of us who love them. And we see their ministry stop. And it's because... They harbored some secret sin, something that they were doing that they weren't supposed to be doing, and they wouldn't stop doing it. And eventually, God just gave them over to it. He says, well, if you want to do that so much, just go ahead and do that. Don't let me get in your way anymore. 
and go ahead. And that's sobering. And if they're doing something right now that you know you shouldn't be doing, stop doing it. Because one day God will stop stopping you and he'll just give you over to it and you'll wallow in it until you give up and say, God, I'm sorry, I want to come back. And that's what happened to Israel over and over again. Oh, I forgot. I want to show you this map of Daniel's exile. For those of you who like maps, I really don't have a whole lot to say about it other than there it is. Boom. Start in Jerusalem. Go to Babylon. All right. Um, Oh, we didn't get to that one yet. So I wanted to remind you of a couple times uh, back in in, uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel uh, 15 it is, uh, when when Saul uh, was supposed to, King Saul was supposed to, killed uh, all, the, all the people of Malachites, and he didn't. He kept the king alive. He kept the best stuff alive. And, he's, and he said, I am going to, uh, I'm going to honor God by, by keeping all of this stuff. But God had specifically told him through the prophet Samuel, destroy it all. Don't keep anything. It defiles you. But he was greedy. He didn't care so much about what God said. He thought that this was his rightful bounty as a king. And so he took it, and he kept it alive. And when Samuel came and said, what did you do? Why do I hear these sheep bleeding and these cows moving? And why is the king here? He says, well, I, the men kind of kept them. I, I thought it was okay. And Samuel's like, no, that was not the instructions that you had from the Lord. And instead of repenting and saying, I'm so sorry, he did admit that he sinned, but he didn't, he didn't repent. He said, just come with me before all the people and bless me. Offer a sacrifice to God with me. And and Saul cared so much about the appearance of being good without actually being good. God doesn't care about that at all. God doesn't care who you are, uh, whether you are are, are like just someone that no one's heard about or you're the pastor of a church of a thousand people. If you are not right, he will let you fall. And we would complain, what about your reputation, God? God says, I don't want people to think I'm right. I want to to be right. And for you to be wrong will lead more people astray than if I just let you fall. So he lets us fall. Those of us who sin, he lets us fall. Because God does care about his name. And he doesn't want us messing around, thinking it's okay to, to, uh, to do bad stuff but still appear holy. He wants us to actually be holy. Then I want to talk about the book of Judges. When he judged, uh, judged them, he, he would allow them to, to flourish, and then they would stop following the Lord, and they would sin against him, and then they would, uh, they would practice idolatry, and then he would allow them to be taken over by a country, And then after they were taken over by the country, they would cry out to him, please save us. And he would send a judge to save them. And then they would do well under that judge until the judge died. And then they would go back to idolatry again. And it was just this cycle. And if you read Judges chapter 2, 10 through 23, it's God's summary of this this cycle. And so it's, it's a really bad thing. And the thing is, we do it ourselves. God saves us from something. And we're like, thank you, God. I'm never going to do that again. And then guess what? We find ourselves back in the same pit. We we need to stop. And in that moment, we feel good about that stopping. But as the days and and the months and the years uh, and isolation creeps in, we find ourselves going back to the things that we think will please us, but they don't. And God says, that's not enough for you anymore. I'm here for you. And we need to rest on God and rely on God. Remember in Samuel chapter 5, when uh, Eli's wicked sons took the Ark of the Covenant into battle with the Philistines, saying, hey, if we bring God's special box with us, it's so goldy and shiny that that we're we're bound to win. And they thought, yeah, that's it. But the Philistines took the box away. God gave them over because of their wickedness. And then they got the box back because God did judge the... the, uh, the Philistines. Um, so that's in 1 Samuel 5, if you, if you want to look at that one up later. Um, and that one's a good story, too, because it has uh, rats and golden hemorrhoids. You'll have to read that one to figure out what that's about. It says tumors officially in the New King James, but it's hemorrhoids. 
It is. Um, and so, so we, we have to realize, though, that God never loses. Even though it seems like he gives us over to our sin, he gave the Israelites over to the Philistines, he never actually loses because in that process he is refining us. He's actually making ourselves better. When I talk to a pastor who's fallen, I tell them, you are actually closer to God now than you had ever been before because before you were always hiding this sin and now it's out in the open. You're not hiding it anymore. So even though you feel really bad about it, you are actually closer to the Lord now than you've ever been before. God is using this for good, no matter how horrible it is. He always uses this for good. We've got to trust him and walk with him. And God never loses. Sometimes it looks like God loses, but in truth, he, he never really loses. I have this game with my kids. Uh, whenever we get into a vehicle, I say, all right, seatbelt race. And we race to see who is the first person to put on their seatbelt, or really who's the last. And usually I'm the last because I have to close their door walk around, open my door, get in the car. I always start the engine before I put the seatbelt on, give them a little more time because I want them to win the race. Because then winning the race means I lose, but I really win because what I'm really trying to do is get them to put their seatbelts on. If you don't do the race, it takes them forever to put their seatbelts on. I figured out that parenting is mostly out manipulating your kids. They try to manipulate you, you just do it better, right? And that's what parenting is. I want you to be a better, a better person, and I'm going to try and make things a uh, certain way so that it's in your best interest to try to be the better person and not be the selfish brat you were born to be because that's who we all are. All right, I lost my place. There's Samuel 5. We did that one. What's next? Oh, yeah, Revelation 12, 12. That's a good one. Um, so God never loses. One time that, we, that the devil thought he won, and I'm convinced the devil thought he won was on that cross. When Jesus died on the cross, I'm sure the devil was thinking, I got it. And some people will think, well, no, the devil was trying to keep him away from the cross. I don't think the devil knew what God's plan was. Because if he did, he wouldn't have uh, entered Judas to betray Jesus to the, to, to the people in the first place. If he knew that was the plan, if he understood what Jesus was talking about, uh, that he must go to the cross, then he, then, then he wouldn't have done it. He just, like, let him live in old age because then he wouldn't have died for our sins. And so, so I think that was a big surprise to Satan. None of the disciples figured it out. Uh, so, uh, and so and Jesus was telling them, I am going to die. And they're like, yeah, right, whatever, Jesus. Um, and so, so Satan thought he won, but then guess what? Jesus rose from the dead, and that was a death blow to Satan. He knew from the resurrection of Christ that that was the fulfillment of prophecy he was trying to prevent. And it had come to pass. And from then on, he still, he still roams the earth. He still wreaks havoc. But he's, he's, he, he roars like a lion, but he doesn't have any teeth. But he is, he's working really hard because he knows his time is short. That's the Revelation 12, 12 passage. He knows his time is short. Do you know his time is short? Doesn't that give you more power over Satan, knowing that his time is short? He has already lost, and all he's doing is punching on his way down? He's lost, and there will, it's only a short time between now, and he can't do anything anymore. So praise the Lord. All right, let's get into the next section of Scripture here. Verses 3 through 7 says, Then the Lord instructed Azpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and, to the king, some of the kings, and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles and young men who were there, in whom there, were no, there was no blemish but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and the quick to understand, who had ability to serve the king in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans, which is another word for Babylonians. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so at the end of, of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Arizaiah. And to them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And so he gave these names to these people, uh, changing them. But let's, let's go back and, and talk about the eunuchs, because that's always a fun topic, isn't it? 
And so, so there is a debate between Bible scholars on whether Daniel and his friends were actually made eunuchs or they were not made eunuchs. And, and the, the whole point, of, or sorry, the whole matter of it isn't really that important. So I'm not going to go in the big discussion of, of, of whether I think they are or they aren't, although I think they are, uh, because they are always under the master of the eunuchs. And if they're under the master of the eunuchs, he's the master of the eunuchs. So that just makes sense. And if you don't know what a eunuch is, praise the Lord. Uh, don't bother finding out. But if you're that curious, um, if you get a male dog and you go to get him fixed, same thing. Um, so anyway, they choose the royal blood, and they make sure they're good-looking guys. Uh, I don't know. Kings don't like ugly people, I guess. I, I don't know. But they're good-looking guys, and that they're smart, that they have, an, uh, they have an ability to learn. They're looking for people because they're sending them to the college, really. They're going to a Babylonian college. Like, hey, you guys are ready for college. I'll send you to college, and you'll learn how to read our language. You'll learn how to speak our language. You'll learn how to write our language. You'll study our poets. You'll study our, our, our everything. Um, and basically, you're going to become Babylonian, uh, even though you're, you're physically and genetically, well, they didn't, have, they didn't talk about genes back then, but even though you are uh, Israeli, really, you're going to be like a Babylonian. You're going to be one of us. That was their plan. Three years of, of college indoctrination on teaching them how to be Babylonian. And in this, they were supposed to lose their identity. Uh, they have new names, uh, which, which are no longer about the Lord. Uh, we have, we, I have them here. Daniel means God is my judge, but his Babylonian name means Bel, which is a Babylonian god, protect his life. Hananiah, which means Yahweh is gracious, good name. Uh, his, his name, Shadrach, means Aku, which is another Babylonian god, is exalted. Uh, Mishael, who is like God? It's like, who is, who is powerful like God? Then his Babylonian name is Meshach, who is like Aku, again, that Babylonian god. And then Azariah is Yahweh has helped. And Abednego means servant of Nego, which, or Nebo, Nego, same guy, another Babylonian god. Um, still not good. Uh, but they're, they're trying to get them to, to change their identities so that they, they don't feel like they're Jewish anymore. They have the Jewish background, so they understand it, um, but they're really Babylonian. And I think that's smart as a king uh, would do it because then if he has any problems with the Jewish people, he could turn to these guys like, what are they thinking? What's their problem? And they would know because they grew up in that. Uh, but he's hoping that their loyalty switched to Babylon. So anyway, that's what's going on there with that stuff. Let's move on to verse 8 through 10. But Daniel prophesied in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine in which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should, you see your fa why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So remember, Daniel is at this, is at this, this it's really like a party college, right? You're still learning college, but every night they get this, this, this feast of food that the king gets. It's, it's the exact same food the king gets to eat. These guys get to eat, and his wine becomes their wine. And he's like, I don't want to drink that, and I don't want to eat that. Um, and that, I don't want to defile myself uh, with, with unclean foods. And, and in those days, the Jews, they drank wine, but they didn't drink as much wine as the Babylonians did. They watered it down. It was usually four parts water to a part wine or up to 11 parts water to a part wine because they, they, they knew they weren't supposed to get drunk. Uh, the, the alcohol was good to kill bacteria. and They probably didn't know. They just knew it made them healthier. It kept them from getting sick. Um, but they, they weren't trying to drink alcohol to get drunk. And so that's what the Jews did. They watered it down. Babylonians did not because they liked getting drunk. Uh, they get themselves in a lot of trouble getting drunk, but we'll get to that later. Uh, not tonight. And then also the, with the foods, it's like Babylonians probably ate pig because, well, pig's delicious. And they're magic. Did you know pigs are magic? They take garbage and they turn it into bacon. It's like magic. Because the stuff you give to a pig, you would never eat it yourself. But then you eat the pig. And it tastes wonderful. And so, so I'm sure the Babylonians were like, this is easy. And have you seen how pigs get? How big they get? Uh, my my mother-in-law raised, raised pigs. She raises them every, every few years because that's how long it takes us to eat one. Um, and we bought one from her, and it was 300-something pounds of meat. 
327, I think, pounds of meat that we got from this pig. That's not including the bones and stuff that we didn't get. That's just the, the, the pig. And, and it took the whole freezer uh, getting this pig in there. Uh, and it was, it was very expensive, but it is so tasty. And we are so, ex we are so excited every time we get to eat it. Um, but it's not kosher because God says don't eat that food. And why does God say don't eat that food? I think there's two reasons. One, pigs aren't necessarily the healthiest food ever. Uh, and especially in those days with no refrigerators and no freezers, they, they kind of start carrying diseases around. People could get sick off of them. So, so for their health reasons, God said don't do it. But also on top of that, God says uh, don't eat it because he wants to separate his people from the other people. So, so if you go to like a party with, with these Jewish guys and they're like, hey, have some bacon. They're like, oh, no, I don't eat bacon. They're like, well, why don't you eat bacon? Because my God told me not to. Well, tell me more about this God. Why, you know? And then so they, they start the conversation. And, and there are some things that we should be doing to be separate from the world. And you're like, well, what's that? And it, it, Do I have to stop eating bacon? That's not where I'm going with this. So take a deep breath. You're okay. But the stuff that defiles us spiritually in this world that we have to be able to say no to. Certain movies, certain TV shows, certain, like now it's like commercials. I don't know, I don't have TV anymore, but every once in a while when I go to someone's house and just the regular commercials that are on, it's like, what? who said that was okay? Someone had to watch this says, oh yeah, that's fine for the general public. Kids are watching this stuff. Certain, certain books, certain uh, music, you know, and I remember when I was in high school ministry, like, you know, I'd hear the kid listen to music. I'm like, what, what did that person just say? They're like, oh, I don't listen to the words. I just listen to the beat. What? what? <laughs> I could get my drum out and just play the same beat on the drum with no words. I guarantee you're not going to like it as much. There's something else there. And, and it's just, well, because we get defiled by this world. My wife complains about the billboards she sees around, which makes sense. They're worth complaining about, I guess. Uh, but it's just there's so much in this world that defiles us. And, and people like go out and they drink all the time. And, and, and they're like, hey, you want some? And you just say, oh, no, thanks. And they're like, why? I remember back when I was in college. You know, and the cool thing to do in college was drink. And I, I didn't drink, not because I was a Christian, because I wasn't a Christian when I started college. It's because my dad drank, and I really hated it. I hated alcohol. So I was like, I'm never going to touch it. And so, and so, but, they, but still, it set me apart. And they started feeling weird around me. Like, we shouldn't be doing this. You should drink to make us feel better. I'm like, I don't want to. Uh, I was like, but they wanted me to because they, they were feeling guilty about it. And just following the Lord's commands shows other people their sin. And they're going to try to get us to be just like them. And guess what? It won't work. One, hopefully, because you say no. But even if you said yes, it still won't work. We won't be just like them because we're not them. We have the Holy Spirit in us, and we would be going against our own consciences. If we try to be like the world, they're going to know that we are fake, and they're going to reject us. And if we try to be like the world, then other Christians are going to be, what are you doing? I don't want to hang around you if you're going to be doing that stuff. And we're going to get rejected by other Christians as well. But if we choose to be godly, then our brothers and sisters will be like, all right, even if we can't do it, like it's like, I have this sin, now I'm trying to get rid of it. I don't want to keep doing this, uh, but I can't stop. I haven't figured it out. Then if you say it that way, a Christian's going to be, I'll help you out, buddy. I'll stand right beside you, and every time you do it, I'll slap your hand away. Or whatever it is, you know, I'll help you stop because we want to help each other stop. And the non-Christians, well, they wouldn't like us anyway, so like, let's just keep doing the right thing and please the Lord. But when we do the right thing and please the Lord and we become people of integrity, they will like us. And if I remember to get to that, we'll get to that tonight. So, looks like we have in that Bible verse, what was it? Ah, there it is. Okay, so... Even though we're not under the law, uh, we the law is still useful for us because it shows us who God is and who we are. Paul said that the law showed him how big of a sinner he is and how much he needed Jesus. You can look that up in Galatians 3, 19 through 25. 
uh, to get a little more information on that. But we're supposed to be different from everybody else. Call, uh, Peter calls us a special people. Some tra Bible translations I like better called peculiar. We're, we're peculiar. But we're different, and we are supposed to be different. Daniel said, I do not want to defile myself uh, by eating these unclean foods. And, and are we being different? Are we being undefiled by the world? So he goes up and, um, oh wait, that's not this one yet. He goes up to the head, the, head, the head of the eunuchs and says, I don't want to eat this food. And the guy says, well, you got to eat the food because I don't want to be in trouble with the king uh, if he sees that you're not as, as, as big and strong as, as everybody else, right? And so, uh, so Daniel says, all right, well, let's think of a plan. And I think he, he goes away because he comes back to a different guy later and talks to him. He says in verse 11, So Daniel said to the steward in whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. So as you see fit, so deal with your servants. And so he consented with them in this manner and tested them 10 days. So he goes to a different guy, uh, a bit lower down on the food chain, um, and says, hey, Let's do a test for 10 days, which isn't too long. If we start to look bad, you know, then you can fatten, you still have time to fatten us back up before uh, the king sees us. So there's not much risk for you, but, but test us in this. Just vegetables and water. Some Bible commentators think when he said vegetables, uh, he didn't mean just vegetables. Uh, he included anything that grows from the ground, like bread, uh, although my wife does not say bread is a vegetable. I, even if I show her this verse and, and go into like, oh, you know, he said, uh, it, he said, oh, I forgot what the word was, um, but it could also mean bread, it could also mean grain, it could also mean rice, all that stuff. She'll probably, she'll still say, no, bread's not a vegetable. Um, and, and even some vegetables, I'm like, well, what about, uh, what about corn, right? That's in the vegetable section. Potatoes, they're right there, the same place in the supermarket. You get corn and potatoes, you get all the, all the vegetables I don't want to eat. And, and, she, and she says, they're not vegetables, they're, they're grains. I'm like, but they're right there. All the noodles and stuff are in a different place. Um, yeah, what else? She says peas aren't a vegetable. That's weird. Iceberg lettuce, I, it's, that's a vegetable, but it's still not good enough. I don't know what's going on there. And tomatoes are supposed to be a fruit. Did you guys know that? That means pizza is a fruit pie. But, uh, yeah, so, so anyway, he wanted to, he, he, he says just vegetables and water, uh, and it could mean grains as well, or, but what it definitely does not mean is meat. He says, don't feed us any meat for these 10 days and see how it works. Oh, I forgot to do that. And then in verse 15, it says, And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine which they drink and gave them vegetables. So there you have it, folks. Vegetables make you fat. That's what the Bible just said, right? That they ate vegetables, you know, vegetables and water for 10 days, and they were fatter than the guys who ate, who ate the meat. There it is. Uh, but the stewards took away. So, so the guys, you know, so they actually are better. I don't think it was the vegetables. I think it was God that blessed them. Um, and so, so the king, or it's not the king, the steward took away all the, all the nice meat and the wine from the other guys. It says, well, if it worked for Daniel and his friends, it's going to work for you too. You guys are all on the same diet. Now you're all vegetarian. Mandatory vegetarianism. Isn't that fun? And so, so I think this is why the, the people wanted to kill him later on in life. You know, it's just like they were fine. They were eating like kings, literally eating like kings. Steak, lobster, bacon wrapped wrap chimp every night. Mm, it was good. Things were great. And then, you know, these fat vegetarians come along, and now nobody gets to eat that stuff. Yeah, they wanted to kill him. That's, that's my personal guess on why they wanted to kill him, because the rest of the book, they're trying to kill Daniel over and over again and his friends. Uh, anyway, verse 17 says, as for, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding and vision and all dreams. Hmm, that's not foreshadowing, right? Does Daniel interpret dreams? Absolutely he does. We're going to get to see that in the next chapter. All right, let's go into verse 18. Now at the end of the days when the king had said that there should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. 
Then the king interviewed them. Among all of them, there was none found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, and he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyprus. Or King Cyrus, not Cyprus. Cyprus is a place. Cyrus is the guy. Um, and so, so God blessed them. They trusted in God that, that uh, if they followed him, that he would take care of them. They followed him, and he took care of them. That's it. And that same trust is there for you as well. It is. Can you keep yourself undefiled uh, by, by in this world? And you don't do that by, you know, like if, if you, let's say like my wife bought a new rug. And she did. She bought a new rug like two days ago. Um, and she put it in the living room, got her old rug out. And I don't know what we're going to do. Does anyone want the rug? It's shaggy and it's hard to vacuum. Um, but it's yours if you want it. Just let me know. And, and so, uh, so we got this new rug, and she says, no, no shoes on it. You got to take your shoes off before you get here. And, and the dog's no longer allowed on the rug. And, and so we had to buy this dog gate to keep the dog out. Um, and the first day, the dog comes in with muddy paws, tries to get on the rug. Got a little spot, and she's down there scrubbing. It's a new rug, first day. Kids ate popcorn. Now popcorn's everywhere. And, and, and the thing is, she wants to keep this rug undefiled. But in, in the same life, we can't just take a shower and wash off the filth of this world. We have to wash ourselves off in the study of his word. Um, and in case you want to know, that's Ephesians 5, 26, where it talks about washing himself, us, uh, us off in, the, uh, in, in the, the water of the word. We need that. We need to be washed off, which is why we come to Bible studies, which is why we do quiet times on our own, which is why whenever we, we, we need hope, uh, we need something to look at. We should open up God's word. It is cleansing for us. Because this world is defiling. This world is dirty. This world gets to us. And if we don't keep washing ourselves in the word, then it gets worse and worse and worse. And guess what happens if you don't take a shower in a long time? You start to stink. And there are some Christians out there that stink because they are not in the word of God. We need to be in the Word of God. We need to do it every single day. Not for just our own good, although it is for our own good, but for those who are near you and love you. Because when you stink, guess what? You don't always know you stink. It's the other people who, who smell it. My, my, my oldest son has stinky feet. And the weird thing is he loves his stinky feet. He says his feet are his favorite kind of stink. And my wife's like, go take a shower. Go wash your feet. Because they smell, I don't know how he gets in the smell so bad. I don't think he does anything in particular, but he, that's what happened. Uh, apparently runs in her family. She said her brother always had stinky feet as well when he was younger. I don't know anything about that. I don't have a sense of smell, so I am blessed with not smelling his feet. Uh, but he does enjoy his stinky feet. Um, but do we keep ourselves undefiled from the world? Do we keep ourselves holy for the Lord? Like Daniel did. We should. And if there is something in your life that is, is keeping you from following him, tonight's the night to lay it down. And if you've never given your Lord, your Lord, the life, if you've never given your life to the Lord, tonight is your night to do so. He took care of Daniel all those 3,000 something years ago. He can take care of you as well. He wants to. He desires to. He died on that cross for you. And if you were the only person on earth, he would still die on the cross for you. He loves you. I know this because he loves me. And the only reason I can tell you that he loves you is because he loves me, and you can't be worse than I was. On the outside, I was, I was sparkly clean. On the inside, I was a low-down, filthy sinner. And I knew my dirt would not scrub off except in the blood of Jesus Christ. He took it away. And he sees me pure and undefiled. Not because of anything I did, but because of what he did. And I am offering to you the same gift that he offered to me all those years ago. Will you give your life to the Lord tonight? Let's pray. My Lord Jesus, you are an amazing God. Thank you so much for this time that we can study your word and we can understand your word and we can live out your word. 
I pray, Lord, that you would help keep us undefiled from the world, however the world decides to try and creep in, through entertainment, through sports, through our devices. Lord, I pray that, that you would alert us to that danger. You would help us build barriers. Or simply just say no. Lord, we love you. We want you to be our sole and largest focus. That we would look to you with our eyes, listen to you with our ears. That we would read your word, and that we would love it, and that we would live it out day after day. And for those of us who don't know you, Lord Jesus, that you would open up the scriptures to us. That they would see as we see who you are. And if that's you tonight, if you decide, if you decide tonight you give your life to the Lord, if you're tired of living in this defiling world and feeling dirty all the time, raise your hand. The Bible says you are a sinner and deserving of death. But Jesus died on that cross to save you from that death. If that's you, raise your hand. Yes, sir, I see you. Pray with me. And, I'll, and, and, and let's, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve the worst. Death on the cross that you died. But Jesus, you took that death on the cross so that I wouldn't have to. You rose from the dead to prove that your love was enough. And you have asked me to join you. And I say, yes, Jesus. Please be my God. Forgive my sin. Bring into me this new life that I can have a life with you as the center. Jesus, be my God. Let me be your child. I love you, Jesus. I pray this in your holy and precious name. you've given your life to the Lord, come talk to me afterwards. I want to pray with you. And if you want to pray about anything else, just come up and one of us will pray with you. And if you're at home or somewhere else and you're watching this, give us a call. Give us a call tonight. Give us a call right now. Give us a call tomorrow. Let us know that you need help so we can pray with you and we can tell you more about this God who loves you and died for you. Jesus loves you so much. He'll do everything he can to help you out.